So let me, let me start by welcoming you all to the first session on day two. Uh, we received a few queries on, on the topic, the theme today, which is, you know, hard choices uh, for the Pacific. Some of this originated from a conversation that a couple of us had with a senior political figure in the PIC-12, who was talking of the challenges of resource allocation as countries try and meet their goals, uh, you know, to decarbonize that have been considered uh, very ambitious. We had a pre-event a couple of days ago for the Pacific where some of this was discussed and we had a, a good gathering of policymakers, we had a gathering of utilities, the regulators, and including from Tonga, and they had brought up this issue of how do we get to these end goals? What are the challenges that, that we see? And it's really fascinating. While the countries across the world are all trying to get to their NDC goals, the Pacific has set a benchmark for where these targets are and how soon they need to be achieved. But what's interesting is it's not just the targets themselves. It's the context in which those goals are being set. And so here we have a situation where you have small islands with extremely weak grids. There's not been a lot of investment in terms of distribution or reliability. You're having challenges with um, skilled manpower being available. You're having challenges with the, uh, you know, the, the kind of uh, technology choices Sometimes there are just a plethora of choices that are coming in, particularly unsolicited proposals, uh, technologies of various shapes and forms, some of which are, you know, technology readiness level 10, which is considered mature, others that are still more emerging. Um, how do they see electricity as an input to other developmental goals, right? Um, and there are also challenges with, with the way resource adequacy is looked at with how tariffs are set. So all of this is the context in which you're trying to get to these end targets, um, but it's very challenging. You, you do not have the space that larger continental grids have in other parts of the world to do, do this transition in a more organized way. And so that's the reason why we had this theme of hard choices. And so today we have lined up a panel for you that will take you through some of the um, experiences both in the Pacific as well as other parts of the world. Let's start with some scene setting by Katrina Sinjalakis, who is the director and head of programs for the Pacific Global Green Growth Institute. Uh, she's based out of Fiji. She's unfortunately not able to travel to us with her and be here today, but she sent us a recorded video and I'll request the organizers to help uh, set that up. Thank you. Hey everyone, my name is Katrina Sinjalakis. I'm an, I am the director and head of programs for the Pacific for the Global Green Growth Institute. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to be part of this session on the Pacific energy transition. And I'm very sorry that I can't be there with you today. I'm now going to share my presentation. So hopefully you can all see that now. And today I've been asked to uh, do a bit of a scene setter before we move into the panelist presentation and discussion. So I'll be providing a high level overview of the energy sector in the Pacific with a focus on energy security. Energy security has to be a central pillar of the green energy transition. Most Pacific Island countries are developing and growing their economies and energy is a driver and an enabler. So it is a crucial component of economic stability and growth. Without energy, the Pacific cannot achieve its planned GDP growth and meet the sustainable development goals. At the same time, energy security is a multifaceted concept, depending on whether you're looking from the national or household level, urban or rural, higher or lower income households or commercial or individuals. Energy security in the Pacific has progressed in some areas, such as energy access and renewable electricity generation, but less in others, such as affordability and energy efficiency while a significant dependence on petroleum imports remains. Climate change is also increasing the vulnerability of the Pacific Island countries and territories. The energy sector must also become more resilient to the impacts of climate change. So looking first at the petroleum, the Pacific 
the Pacific is that uh, island countries and territories are still very much dependent on petroleum imports. As you can see, there's been an increase in consumption in line with population and GDP growth. While Fiji, Guam, PNG, and New Caledonia account for about 80% of the total uh, fuel consumption. If we look at commercial consumption and sectoral breakdown, recent accurate data is not readily available. Um, the data we do have shows that the breakdown is around 56% transport, 34% electricity, and 10% other uses. So there's quite limited up-to-date and consistent data on the use of commercial energy. And there's nearly no reliable data on non-commercial energy consumption, for example, wood for cooking. Commercial energy consumption has grown around 2% per year, but the lack of sectoral data at the national level and the uncertainty and inconsistency regarding final energy consumption by sector really shows the need for improved data collection analysis and dissemination. The high proportion of uh, energy used in the transport sector, meanwhile, is certainly is an indication that it will be very important to tackle the transport sector in the energy transition. And if electrification of transport is the pathway chosen, which seems likely, this will place a significant additional demand on electricity utilities, which must be planned for well in advance. For example, projections for the Fiji Low Emission Development Strategy show that electricity generation would need to almost triple to accommodate a fully electrified land transport sector in Fiji. But what does energy security mean? Um, IEA defines it as the uninterrupted availability of energy sources at an affordable price. In the past, emphasis was on petroleum and other fossil fuels, but recently the IEA has included renewables and promoted the need for reducing vulnerability by improving resilience to a wide variety of shocks, including natural disasters and geopolitical conflicts. But there isn't really any definition consensus on the definition of energy security, in part because it depends a lot on where in society one sits. Governments tend to emphasize um, measures to mitigate supply disruptions, private citizens and small businesses want reliability and affordability. Um, urban communities want to avoid power disruptions. For low income groups and rural communities, a limited basic supply of commercial energy uh, can empower women and girls, lead to better education for children, and improve health care. Only in the last decade has there been much discussion of what energy security means for Pacific Island countries and territories, with the concept becoming associated in part with the transition to renewable energy and linked to climate change mitigation. On the other hand, um, picked energy policies until recently, the strategies, the policies, and plans did not either did not mention at all or place little emphasis on adaptation to climate change for energy systems. This is starting to change with the new regional framework for energy security and resilience in the Pacific, which was endorsed by the region's leaders in 2021. So looking at some of the indicators for um, energy security and looking here at petroleum imports as a percentage of GDP, which examines affordability at the national scale, the data shows a mixed situation. Despite an overall reduction in fuel imports as a percentage of GDP across the region, heavy dependence remains. And this means also a continued vulnerability to price fluctuations and supply disruptions. For some of the smaller countries, the value of fuel imports against GDP have changed hardly at all. So essentially unchanged over this period. Looking at affordability then at the household and commercial level, um, after a peak in 2012, residential tariffs across the region have dropped by 2018, 2019. Um, this reflects uh, the trend in world oil prices. Um, however, in some Pacific Island countries and territories, subsidies and below cost tariffs are still being used to keep electricity price at an affordable level. While there are good arguments and a role for subsidies for low-income households, there is a need for these subsidies to be more targeted, to be efficient. 
below cost tariffs applied to broadly could have negative impacts for energy security as governments have to cover the cost of subsidies and utilities which do not charge or recover the full cost of supply will be less able to provide operation and maintenance and therefore um, uh, this jeopardizes a reliable energy supply in the future. Across the region, tariff reviews could support more targeted subsidies, as well as introducing where needed and appropriate the time of use tariffs and supporting peak and load management within utilities. Now, uh, other presenters will talk about electrification and, re and renewables, I believe, so I will, I will be brief here. But uh, in the Pacific, uh, electrification rates are very high. Most countries, uh, with the exception of PNG, Solomon Islands and Vanuatu, have reached or are approaching 100% access. And on the renewable energy side, um, there have been uh, a, a great advancements. However, renewable energy as a percentage of total generation has not changed that much. It's about 28%. Um, However, if we look at the 12 smaller Pacific Island countries, there has been a change over the last 20 years. So renewables are now have changed from providing 14 to 21 percent of electricity supply. Now, that is a significant diversification of electricity supply, which can contribute to improved uh, electrical energy security. At the same time, um, solar, uh, solar generation has increased um, exponentially. If we look at uh, solar has in particular is um, is providing uh, a lot has is having a big impact in Polynesia and the Micronesian states where it accounts for a large amount of the renewable electricity generation. However, due to its intermittent nature um, to reach ambitious renewable energy targets in these countries, battery storage and grid stability technology is also essential and does add significant cost. Overall, renewables have a lot of have a lot of aims in terms of their implementation. It it can help to diversify supply, um, reduce dependency on fossil fuels, uh, increase reliability of supply, and reduce long term costs. And of course, the mitigation of climate change. Um, however, at the moment, certainly at least in the short term, there's evidence to suggest that renewables alone cannot reduce costs and reduce tariffs, as system storage, stability, distribution, and transmission costs also need to be factored in. But what renewables uh, and, and solar energy can provide is a known and stable long-term cost to counter petroleum price fluctuations and increase security of supply. In terms of equitable access, um, renewables, of course, have a big role to play in low-cost off-grid electrification where that is still uh, needed in the countries where that is still needed. And I would like to touch a little bit on energy efficiency, which is probably the most underutilized tool um, for energy security in the Pacific. Um, fiscal and regulatory incentives are generally lacking for energy efficiency, particularly in building sector. Um, and renewable energy and energy efficiency should be factored in in the development or review of building code, codes across the, the Pacific Island countries. Uh, energy efficiency remains a significant untapped opportunity for cost effective increase in energy security and for climate change mitigation. Only two major regional in initiatives have been undertaken over the last decade. Um, and although energy efficiency is mentioned in numerous policies, there has been a shortage of funding and concrete actions. So energy efficiency could be a low hanging opportunity for improvements in the near future, both on the demand side and on the supply side. Now, looking to the future and a few words to to uh, finish off my um, my presentation. Um, the energy system and infrastructure assets that we implement today will make the difference for climate resilience and energy security for the next 20 years and, and more. Every electricity interruption of supply is a loss for GDP, so we must be taking into account the future impact of climate change and supporting utilities to prioritize upgrades of electricity infrastructure for climate resiliency. Locations of assets will matter a lot as flooding becomes more frequent and land loss 
increasingly becomes a reality for the Pacific. As you can see here, the, the map on the right is of Tonga Tapu in Tonga, and, and, the, and the pink areas are projected flooding, uh, flooded areas and land loss over the next 30 years. So, of course, looking at energy infrastructure and looking where it's located on the islands is going to be an important factor in the future. Private sector also has uh, uh, the potential to bring in millions in investment, um, particularly for renewable energy under the right regulatory conditions. In investment into climate proofing and into renewables, it will be very important. Um, and investment today in, in climate proofing can, you know, one dollar invested today can save between three and seven dollars in future um, uh, repairs and maintenance needs and replacement costs. So it's it makes a lot of sense to make that investment today, but it does it does make upfront uh, capital costs higher. Um, and it's widely recognize that the public sector alone will not be able to cover the costs of climate proofing and um, driving the energy transition. So it is going to be um, vital to bring in uh, the private sector um, and enable the private sector to be involved in, um, in the energy transition. So while continued investment is needed for renewables and energy efficiency, a greater shift in climate finance towards adaptation and development of resilient energy systems in Pacific Island countries is vital. And finance must also be found for securing petroleum supplies and their safe use while they are still needed. Taking Fiji as an example, its climate vulnerability assessment uh, emphasize the need for future infrastructure investments to ensure resilience to climate change and natural hazards, and indicated that almost nine billion Fiji uh, nine billion Fiji dollars will be needed. Um, climate ready infrastructure typ typically adds three percent to upfront costs globally, but saves four dollars overall for every dollar spent. Therefore, to strengthen energy security cost effectively. Every energy infrastructure project going forward needs to find the finance to cover this upfront adaptation cost to lower the long term adaptation costs to Pacific Island countries. Finally, a regional approach and cooperation on best practices, standards and other areas could assist in aggregation of projects, increase effectiveness and efficiency and incentivize private sector investment, particularly for energy in tourism, maritime and land transport and energy efficiency. Thank you very much. Uh, so we just had uh, Katrina highlighting some of the high level challenges that countries face um, as they plan for the 2030 uh, future. Uh, this is some of this was work that was done in the context of the framework for energy security in the Pacific. And she's been uh, kindly able to bring that out. Uh, there are a couple of points around, uh, you know, the impacts of COVID. Uh, price variations that we're seeing, particularly over the last year or so, that have added urgency to that debate. Uh, we now have um, Abraham Simpson. Uh, Abraham has been the former CEO of the Nauru Utility, covering power, water, sewerage, uh, land transport, and shipping in various roles. He has over 30 years of experience operating uh, big grids in, in Fiji and Nauru, and has been an advisor to multiple agencies in the region. Uh, he will help share a uh, utility perspective on some of these challenges in, in terms of what's happening on the ground. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Um, good morning. Uh, and I uh, appreciate uh, being here to help you understand the Pacific and its challenges especially with regards to the power utilities. As the, the power utilities um, are the key energy providers in the Pacific Islands. Um, I have pressed it, I've pressed it. 
This is something. Oh, okay, sorry. Oh, we, we're getting in a few slides into it. Can we go back a bit? <laughs> All right. Are we ready? All right. Oh, not happening. Do I have to ring a bell? <laughs> I'm trying to press them. It doesn't want to work. The power's failure, I think. Open the stars, guys. Sorry. Yeah. Oh. I think there's something in this video. Too. Okay. <laughs> You're going to have to imagine what's on the slide, and I'm, I'm just going to speak to you. Can the person there be changing the slides? Yeah, it's not working. Anyway, um, as expected, the power utilities, they... Um, the key uh, energy providers in the Pacific Islands. I suppose we'll start off with this. Um, this uh, just summarizes the uh, electricity access rate. Um, 2020, middle of uh, just as COVID was happening. And you can see that many of the islands have almost reached 100%. Now, they are mainly small islands like Nauru or uh, the single islands, Nauru and Nui, or there are a few islands with uh, populations on uh, several small, island, small islands. The big ones are Kiribati, uh, not Kiribati, uh, PNG, that uh, have a lot. Now, the excess rate of PNG is 61, but it's anything between 15% and 61%. No one really knows the figure. <laughs> First, they don't really know what's the exact population. That's one of the issues. And um, and um, that's what I'm told. They, they're certain the ones that are connected to the grid have power. So a low estimate is 15%. Um, Solomon's, of course, and uh, Vanuatu, the Melanesian uh, ones are the ones that have uh, lower access. So there's a huge challenge there. Been estimated 1.5 to 3 million billion US dollars um, to reach a 100% target. Can we? I'm going to do hand signals. Next slide. Next slide. All right, the targets. You can see the targets. Uh, I'm not going to go through each one of them for the islands. They're pretty aggressive. And they're getting, uh, politicians are getting more and more aggressive. For instance, Tonga only about a month or so ago, it was 70% by 2030. They changed it to 70% by 2025. Right. Samoa, they changed it from 100% by 2025. To 70% by 2030, but they redefine what 70% means. It means the total energy use, including transport. That means electricity, <laughs> the pressure is still on <laughs> because electricity is less than 50% of their energy. So, you know, uh, so these are very aggressive targets, and it's a good thing politicians are pushing, uh, pushing this. Um, I was tempted to say, if they only left it to the engineers, then we'll achieve it. <laughs> Let's go to the next slide, please. All right, uh, some of the challenges for the utilities, uh, planning uh, coordination. I find it working in Fiji, working in uh, 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 Nauru for seven and a half years in, uh, and uh, working with a lot of utilities, there's a need for planning uh, coordination uh, closer planning and coordination. Um, I won't go into details here. There's limited financial resources, uh, human capital. I think the slides are mixed up somewhere. Anyway, human capital, capacity development. You know, in the Pacific, we have an issue here. There's a uh, plant in uh, Samoa, 800 uh, kilowatt uh, biomass or biogas plant. They have enough fuel. They needed 29 people to harvest the wood to supply the fuel, uh, supply the plant to operate uh, continuously. 23 just upped and left for New Zealand to go and work in this uh, worker scheme. And it was the older ones that were left to do the harvesting. And of course their productivity in that regard is not so. <laughs> so, you know, they have issues. 
And it's common around the Pacific. People are just moving. As soon as they get a bit of qualification, in the South, it's Australia, New Zealand. In the North, it's the US. So utilities kind of beginning to think that they are a training institution. <laughs> that's, that's a real problem. Regulation, uh, there's some laws that still protecting monopoly of some utilities, not all. Some are starting to change that and change the policies. Tariff reform. There's a perception that tariff will, uh, will go down, will decrease as you increase uh, VRE in the grid. And it's not quite true, but anyway, that's what is being pushed. And that's why the politicians are pushing hard for this because dealing with fuel, um, the fuel um, uh, prices, it, it has been a real uh, challenge and security of supply. You know, normally it's cheap diesel. We've been used to that. But now you're bringing in all this VRE and BES and security. The engineers are wondering, what is this? Uh, how do we deal with it? I mean, you can have 10 days straight of rain. How much battery capacity are you going to give you that security? <laughs> you can't afford that. And trying to deal with all these issues is going to, you get a dry season during the El Nino. And if you have hydro, you know what that means. Huh? Where are you going to get the capacity to, to meet that, um, that uh, variation in uh, energy, that reduction during those periods? So it, it is a real challenge, but unfortunately the public don't understand those things. Uh, okay, they think you just stick in a solar panel and stick in a battery, that should be enough. Uh, that's that thing. Can we go to the next slide? Can we go to the next slide? I'm sorry, something's, something's messed up with uh, what I sent through last night. I don't know what's the issue. Okay, but there's one thing that's missing. If you look at the Pacific, all these islands, if you shift China a bit to the east and North America a bit to the west, stick Europe in the middle and bring South America, that's the Pacific. That's what we're dealing with in terms of area. And yet we have small island populations all over the place. Very um, challenging to work in that area. Uh, one of the things that uh, we need to understand is the grid will have to survive. One of the biggest challenges I find in the Pacific now is this rooftop solar. And people, don't blame them, are trying to make it more attractive for people to put solar on their roof. But they're not looking at the grid side. I took one country, and I'm not going to name it, and, and looked at the benefits to both the utility and to the homeowner or the prosumer. Prosumer has a payback of four years. Utility has a payback of infinity. You don't run a business that way. And if the grid don't su su survive, it's not going to be that efficient uh, in meeting your demand. Um, and it's something that has to be thought of carefully before implementing. A lot of people told me, oh, utilities are very resistant to it. No, they're not resistant. They just know what the business returns are. Pure economic sense, it's not uh, irrational. You just need to sit down and work out a win-win situation where everybody walks away, walks away knowing that they come out with, uh, with, uh, with benefits. The consumer gets his return and the utility is able to survive. Unfortunately, the small utilities don't have the option of experiencing the death spiral before they can change. They're too small. They might get there too fast <laughs> and things don't move. So there's a need for the grid and there's need to have better security. But there's one thing I, I want to mention in the last slide. Utilities have, a lesson, have something to learn. 
it's the business as usual is not going to uh, cut it here. They cannot they have to change their way of business and thinking. That old traditional mindset has got to change. That's the biggest challenge. The engineering is the easy part, I always say. It's the head that's the hard part. Getting the thinking changed. And I say that based on experience in changing utilities. That's one of my uh, subject, uh, one of my pet uh, favor uh, love. So let's go to the last slide. I'm sorry, it's all mixed up, but I don't know. Um, these are some of the things. Let's just go to the last slide because uh, I'm confused of how this thing has come mixed up. Yeah, let's go to the uh, slide eight. Let's finish off there. Slide eight. It summarizes everything, the challenge in my place, uh, my thoughts. Yeah. Uh, nine, sorry, nine. Yeah, this is the one slide that sums up everything regarding the Pacific. It's a blackout. That's what you get when the non-engineers try to drive the change. This is a summary of the position. We have a huge challenge. We all ride in a paper boat. We don't know it though, and it might sink. And the Pacific is facing the impact of climate change before any of the others. What is needed? All stakeholders, utility, governments, regulators, private sector, development partners, public, all need to be involved in consultation, all need to have input, and all need to sit down and work out a plan and get it done. And I say this bluntly just to sum up, there's too much policy talk and all, it's time to just put plants in the ground and get it done. The work's not done with a good plan. A good plan is useless if it is not implemented. That's my last uh, thought with you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Abraham. Uh, and for also showing us, you know, how Pacific utilities need to deal with real-time challenges. <laughs> you brought in your experience in terms of dealing with that. Thank you. Um, I think we'll now move to uh, the next panelist. We have Mark Matsura. Uh, Mark is from the Hawaii National uh, H HNEI, and he's been associated with the Grid Smart program there. He will be sharing experiences in terms of how uh, the state of Hawaii in the U.S. has looked at various models in terms of their, uh, you know, plan to to increase variable renewable energy and, and how that's kind of uh, you know, resulted in the situation that they have now. Mm -hmm. So I think he's going to share some of that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hello. Yeah, good morning. Good to be here. Um, I'll just go over uh, kind of the Hawaii uh, islands as a whole and then dive into a couple of case studies of a couple of islands. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about the net energy metering that uh, Abraham teed up. So go next slide. Okay, a lot of information here, but um, we have um, the four electric utilities, kind of six main islands. I just wanna point you to the, the yellow numbers in the islands is the instantaneous renewable energy penetration. So not by energy, but the highest by you know power for each island. Uh, so Kauai, you can see 100% renewable at times, uh, they've been, they started at like a half an hour and now they're going, you know, several, I think up to 10 hours now of 100% renewable. Um, and I'll get into that. So that's one island I'm gonna talk about it specifically. The red numbers, you can see these, that's the uh, VRE percentage as a percentage of the peak demand of each island. So you can see we've gotten very high on Kauai. Um, so obviously they need battery storage on that. Um, other islands, we don't have much battery storage, but we've still gotten to very high levels of, of BRE, uh, even without the battery storage. In the, in the white boxes, you can see the resources that are coming online now. We've gotten to the point where we can't take much more PV during the day, so they need to come with battery storage. So four hours of battery storage to shift it into the evening. 
but you can see like um, one electric company on Oahu, this is the largest demand grid about a little over a gigawatt. Um, and they've, they've got, if you can see it on here, but a gigawatt, a gigawatt hour worth of storage that's coming online with about 300 megawatts of solar. So a lot going on. The other island I'm gonna talk about is Molokai. It's a small island. Uh, you can see on this, under Ma, it's under Maui Electric Company. Uh, it's uh, about a five megawatt peak island. They've got 2.7 megawatts of rooftop solar on that system. So I'll contrast a little bit. Molokai is just kind of exclusively rooftop solar. Uh, Kauai Electric took a little different tack. They focus more on the central solar uh, to, to get to where they are today. Uh, and just to kind of expand on the point Abraham brought up about getting everybody in the same room, this, uh, we had a, in 2008 with the financial crisis and the, the spike in oil prices, our electricity rates doubled in that time frame. So that was a wake up call. We had a, a recession in Hawaii because of that. The policymakers, the utility, got together and there was a white clean energy agreement that the utility and the government uh, agreed to RPS of 70% at the time. Uh, but the utility also needed to remain solvent. Like you said, the, the utility need, needs to, to survive. Uh, so they did a decoupling thing. And that's a topic for tomorrow. <laughs> we'll get into that a little more. So if you wanna hear more about that, come at four o'clock uh, tomorrow. Uh, anyway, so that's that uh, next slide. <laughs> Okay, so Molokai, it's uh, again, small island. I think it's about 7,000 uh, residents on that island, but very beautiful. Uh, for that system, um, it, it basically kind of evolved as a, they, they did net metering rooftop solar. And in the beginning, we had about 1.1 megawatts of, of uh, rooftop solar that came on early on under the NEM program. And that's a full retail NEM. So you, you, know, you get credited at the same rate for your export as you buy in your consumption. Um, but at that time, what the issue was, the interconnection standards weren't really uh, there yet. So we used the IEEE 1547 standard, which this all the PV disconnects uh, at 59.3 Hertz. So if you know for small islands, the, the frequency will get there quickly. <laughs> so, and, so every time we trip the generator, all the PV would trip offline. And, and it, it, we lowered it a little bit, but it still wasn't enough. So now we've got down to 50 Hertz, which is what it should be, but we had a problem. So now when you have all of these rooftop solar systems and the, and the settings aren't quite right, we had to install a battery system at the university. We helped them develop a, a system to help stabilize the grid. So when they lost the generator, they lost the PV, the, P, the battery was able to kind of kick in and help stabilize things. Um, but with this level of solar, they're now at a point that they can't turn down their generators during the day anymore. They're at their minimum operating point. So they're kind of at a limit to how much solar that they can take on the grid. So right now they're at about mm, maybe 13, 14% renewable by energy. And they're kind of limited now. <clears throat> so um, the next thing they're trying to do is a community-based solar with solar battery that would again, shift it. But so there was a lot of pain and effort going into getting this rooftop solar to work. Plus most of this is all retail NEM. So there's a fairness issue that was, uh, we Hawaii stopped that retail NEM program in 2015, but all the solar was on or in the queue uh, before that. Um, uh, the other thing we did, just a side note, they put a, a dynamic load bank because at times there was a risk that it would the solar would drive the generators down below their minimum point. So we put uh, the university I'll put this load bank in just to give them a, a cushion. They've never actually used it yet, but it, it gives the operators another tool in their belt. If the solar, if there is a low load day and a high solar day, they have a tool to kind of deal with it. So uh, okay. Uh, anyway, oh, and then the resources, it's it's basically diesel fired uh, in, internal combustion engines on the side. Uh, next slide. Sorry, let's speed up a little bit more. Uh, Kauai, so next slide. So Kauai, they've done well, an amazing job actually getting their renewables online. Uh, 2012, you can see 
uh, of oil, so 10% renewable. 2022, they're up to 60% renewable and only 40% of oil. Um, and so in early on, they said, when the NEM program came, they said, you know, we're not gonna take a big slug of um, retail NEM. They limited to, I think, seven megawatts. Um, and so, because we, we wanna do central solar. So they focused on first they had a couple of big solar plants without battery, because they could take it with their um, diesel generators and they have a CT combustion turbine. Um, and then, then they started putting on the solar and solar with batteries. So this, this system is a 80 megawatts, so it's a bigger grid. So they do have more scale, so they can do, uh, you know, they got good pricing on their central solar projects. Let's see, so yeah, so you can see up there, they first ran 100% renewable in 2019. Now they're doing a lot of hours uh, almost every day, being able to run 100% uh, renewable if there's, if there's a lot of sun. Uh, they have some biomass and some hydro. The hydro's not really, really big dams. It's more kind of run of river kind of hydro stuff. Okay, next slide. So we talked about uh, why, why are we doing this? So it was to help to maintain our, our, our electricity prices. So you can see the average retail rates for 2022 up there on the right. So Kauai with their central solar projects, they were able to actually reduce their rates a bit. So they're below many of the islands in Hawaii now. And not only have they reduced it a bit, they're keeping it more stable. So since they're not as reliant on oil like the others are more reliant as the oil prices go up and down, everybody else has to kind of ride that, that wave, right? Um, so that's, that's kind of one of the choices, right? Is uh, do I do the kind of more distributed stuff or do central solar stuff? So for uh, Kauai, you know, they, tend, they chose a central and it's, it's worked out for them so far. Um, okay. Oh, and then the next story for Kauai is once you get to kind of the 60% renewable level with solar, you can't really, you know, like Abraham said, you're gonna need long-term storage to kind of go beyond that. The four hour level of storage and solar only works on, when you get higher than that with the long days of no sun, you know, you need a lot more. So Kauai is putting in a pump storage project. So it's a solar, um, solar battery hydro pump storage. And with that project, they think they can get to about 90% renewable. So, so they're getting, they're getting, gonna get there fairly quickly. Okay, next, next slide. Uh, again, lot, you can look at this slide later when you have more time, but uh, Hawaii's transitioned away from the retail NAM in 2015. Like I said, it ended. Uh, right now they have a grid supplier where you can put power on the grid, but it requires some control. Uh, smart export, if you export during the peak demands, you get more money. And the rates are kind of here where you get, but it's in the, you know, kind of teens cents, whereas the uh, avoided costs for the islands are more in the 20, 25 cents realm. So we're not paying based on avoided costs. We're paying more on what's the value of the exported energy. What, and what's the, um, what do people need, you know, to kind of make their economics work? So it's not so much based on avoided cost of oil, right? Which a lot of our systems are oil-based. It's more based on, the economics of what people need to make their solar projects viable. Um, so that's keeping the, the export costs down. Um, and then even the customer self-supply, there's a no export program, but even at these rates, you know, 50, 40 cents a kilowatt hour, 50, it, just avoiding consumption is enough to pay for the solar battery systems in the, the no export uh, program. And it's about people are signing up, so it's, it's, it's in the money. Uh, okay, I think I am out of time. I think that's my last slide. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Mark. That was really interesting to understand some of these different options that Hawaii has, has been looking at. Uh, our next speaker is from the Maldives. Uh, another small island developing country, but in a different part of the world. Uh, we have Director Abdullah Nashid. He's the Director of Technical Services at FINACA, which is the uh, utility servicing almost 160, uh, 156 to be precise, 
uh, islands in the Maldives, uh, except for the capital city of Malay. Uh, he's been an electrical engineer and has uh, been involved with some of this work over the last 10 years. And he's here to present uh, Fenaka's, Fenaka's uh, decisions and, and how that kind of impacted uh, their roadmap and ability to kind of move forward. First of all, thank, thank you very much uh, for giving this opportunity. Uh, and uh, although Maldives is not a Pacific uh, Island country, I hope uh, that uh, the experience that the, the journey that Maldives has uh, undertaken in uh, going to renewable energy will be uh, good knowledge sharing for all the Pacific Island countries. And uh, I have uh, named this as re-energizing the uh, power sector in Maldives because uh, actually Maldives has achieved 100% electrification within the past couple of years. And now we are moving towards the renewable energy and energizing our grid systems and the power systems with the renewable energy. I think, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and uh, going for a country overview, actually we are having a, 1,192 uh, islands and uh, 168 uh, tourist resorts. And uh, uh, from the 1,192 islands, actually, uh, we are having uh, 187 inhabited islands where we are, uh, our utility companies are uh, providing the electricity. And the population is almost uh, 500,000. And actually, uh, our area is 115,000. Uh, 300 square kilometers, but the island uh, or the land area is very small. So uh, next, next, next slide, please. So looking at the power sector uh, and uh, uh, looking at the brief history, actually uh, the power sector started to develop uh, within the early 80s and the uh, 1980s and up to 2009 actually. Electricity is mostly owned by the community, given by uh, the uh, island communities. And uh, looking at the statistics, uh, at the uh, time of 2009, 85% of the uh, power uh, is produced, 85% uh, of the island is powered by the community, and 10% of the island is powered by local NGOs and state owned uh, electricity company at that time is Telco only, and they have only 5% of the islands at that time. And actually, uh, 2009 is a hallmark year or a milestone year in which actually all the uh, uh, islands came under different seven provincial utility created at that time. And uh, so um, after that, to, uh, 2009 to 2012, this, uh, uh, most of the islands are operated by these provincial state-owned uh, utility companies. But uh, that time also a few, or some of the islands are operated by the islands councils uh, formed by that time. And uh, just going a bit behind, in 2008, actually, uh, officially it is declared that uh, Maldives had uh, reached 100% of the 100% uh, electrification or population of all uh, uh, Maldives is uh, catered by electricity in 2008. And uh, actually, uh, another hallmark decision or milestone decision is uh, actually in 2012, in which uh, six of the provincial utilities uh, again uh, merged into one utility company uh, formed uh, and named as Fenaka. And uh, I'm representing that utility company who is uh, actually uh, engaged in uh, producing power to uh, giving power to. Um, more than 156 islands uh, throughout the country now. And uh, in the central region, the Stelco or State Electric Company is operating, giving power to uh, three atolls uh, in the central uh, region. So, uh, and uh, last year, actually, we had, uh, all of the islands were uh, under the utility companies. Uh, in, so 100% of the island is now uh, powered or electricity is given by, uh, State-owned utility companies, Telco and Fenaka. 
And some of the noteworthy points to mention is actually a uh, power system developed in uh, outer islands and smaller islands are driven mostly by the island community and actually without the uh, government, uh, the island com community's will and determination actually started this uh, uh, road towards the electrification in Maldives. So that is one uh, key point that we have to, uh, because uh, at that time, actually, uh, uh, island communities were uh, actually like the fishing uh, community, they get that one year's uh, 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 catch of the fish. And then actually th that investment they used to buy up a generator set, diesel generator set and put a power plant like that. The island communities actually developed their islands uh, electrification needs at that time. And after that, actually, uh, uh, all, when the, all the islands were uh, uh, having the electricity, then only the government decided that this need to be regulated. This need to be actually uh, come under some framework. And then came this 2009 uh, utility uh, companies, as I mentioned before. Then uh, actually in 2008, it's uh, actually we received 100% received, uh, electrification. Uh, and uh, that is uh, 20, so now uh, from 2008 onwards, uh, each household will have 24 hours access to electricity in Maldives, in all the islands, in all the 187 inhabited islands. So uh, next, next slide, please. So this is uh, actually uh, looking at uh, some of the power systems at around 2008, 2009, actually the island communities developed it but they couldn't maintain or sustain it. And uh, so uh, it, uh, the uh, condition went very poor. And uh, so next, next slide, please. Yeah, then uh, this is the, uh, now after uh, coming under Fenaka, these are the new uh, developments that we have taken and uh, upgrade to the power system. Next slide, please. So uh, after uh, 2012, actually uh, another hallmark or the milestone decision is actually going to the renewable energy sector and, uh, and, and POIS project of preparing outer island for sustainable energy development is one of the key uh, projects that uh, uh, shifted the paradigm of, uh, from going from, uh, from diesel to the renewable energies actually. And in the POIS project, uh, ADB actually helped, uh, the figures are there, and as boys uh, output 24 megawatt and uh, 10 megawatt uh, hours of storage, we have 18 and 20 megawatts of diesel uh, generator sets we have actually uh, in 160 countries. And we, uh, the outcome is actually 30% of the peak demands of the most islands uh, by uh, PV. And uh, we are having a diesel a saving of 0.1 to 0.3 liters per kilowatt hour and reduced carbon dioxide emissions. So this is one of the milestones like the uh, programs or the projects we have held actually a paved path for to the renewable energy into actually from 2012 onwards the project was uh, formulated and it was uh, the pilot phase was actually completed in 2016 and uh, uh, in, if we have facing it out in uh, and in a cluster of islands we are having uh, the program still running next slide please so, uh, and with the POIS project, uh, another um, decision is actually in the Addo city, we have got the JF, JSCM, uh, uh, Japanese uh, uh, Fund for Joint Credit Mechanism uh, uh, and Battery Energy Storage Project, actually, because uh, we also have learned, uh, as um, in some of the presenters before, actually, uh, without the bat battery energy storage, the grid stability is affected. So we need to have the battery energy storage and this is one of the successful uh, energy storage projects within the POIS project we have undertaken. Next slide, please. So uh, now actually uh, in EPC model or with the donor agencies and uh, with utility solars, we can go only to a, a certain extent. And um, we have got very ambitious targets of 30, uh, 2030 we, uh, to achieve key carbon neutral. And it's a very challenging um, um, a target, but uh, we believe with uh, interventions uh, from the private sectors, we can achieve this target and we, we can go further in 
in uh, increase the renewable energy penetration. As such, uh, ADB actually formed another uh, project within Maldives named as Assure. And uh, so in that private sector investment in renewable energy is enhanced and up to 48% of our renewable energy is uh, covered within uh, 20 islands. Uh, and this includes floating solar and also uh, there is sovereign investment support uh, from uh, ADBIT in uh, BES and uh, EMS and GRID. And the solar panel, uh, the solar is installed under the PPA model under this uh, project. And uh, yeah, we can go to the next slide, please. So uh, well, this is one of, our, one of the output uh, of this project with the private sector and sovereign intervention, intervention in which, as I mentioned, solar PV is produced by the independent power product producers uh, and uh, sold uh, to the utility under the PPA model, where, however, the uh, sovereign investment uh, gives the grid upgrade and the battery storage, which is necessary to increase the solar energy penetration. Next slide, please. And uh, these are the islands, uh, 20 islands, uh, and the bidding process is underway. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So another outcome of this project we expect is the marine rena renewable energy sector. And I think Mr. My Michael will give a, a more comprehensive uh, presentation on this. Uh, next, please. So uh, in the marine renewable energy, we are looking for the tidal wave. And uh, because uh, in small island nations, the large, uh, we have large uh, ocean areas. So um, again, uh, we can go to the next slide, please. So uh, from the Fenaka perspective, actually, uh, we have the future plans to, uh, for grid rehabilitation because uh, right now also we are observing uh, the grid uh, need to be enhanced or rehabilitated or upgraded uh, to uh, cater for the large renewable energy penetrations uh, that we are expecting uh, to achieve within uh, and 70% uh, of renewable energy, we want to uh, achieve 70% of uh, energy by renewable energy with, by 2030. So in that case, we need to enhance our grid. And also uh, there are small home solar systems. Actually, we are looking uh, for uh, under net metering, which need to be actually uh, integrated into the grid. So uh, we need uh, grid support and also um, battery energy storage. So these are the, some of the, uh, future plans that Penaka has uh, for increase the renewable energy penetrations. Next slide, next slide, please. Yeah. So these are some of the features. Uh, we see that the power transformation that has occurred. Ne next. Yeah. Ne next. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we're running a little behind time, so we had another online presentation, but what we'll do is we'll move now to Mike Bundo. Uh, Mike Bundo will help us uh, understand some of the options around newer technology, which are not always part of you know, the, the standard roadmaps that we see or not always considered extremely mature, but they could potentially help diversify sourcing for island countries and potentially bring in some more diversity and reliability. Uh, as well as open up other avenues for socioeconomic development. So over to you, Mike. Okay. Good morning. <clears throat> so I'm uh, going to speak about uh, maybe not, not too off tangent, but very relevant to, to island nations um, and for the Pacific Islands, especially now that um, we're speaking about energy transition. I think uh, we need to think about um, beyond just uh, electricity and energy for let's say household use and enabling sort of uh, current uses. Uh, we need to think about other blue economy development enabled by uh, energy, renewable energy and its integration um, towards product productive use. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so I like this figure a lot because it talks about the, the blue economy in a figure, um, an infinity figure, which kind of symbolizes sustainability. And it has 
facets of different technologies um, coming together with environment, with people, with certain, um, should we say, economic activities, whether it's ports, it's shipping, it's tourism. So you have renewable energy, there's shipping, um, and, and you have uh, you know, waste management even. Um, so this kind of goes to symbolize um, what also we, uh, for under the Maris project of the Asian Development Bank, which looks at regenerative marine industries. So combining marine aquaculture, reefs, renewable energy, and ecotourism for ecosystem services. That's a mouthful, but Maris for short. The next slide, please. There are some uh, uh, bit of caveats that we need to maybe be aware of. And um, the top part of this slide uh, is just the, the legend. So don't read into that as um, categories, but there is a market and technology differentiation that we need to be aware of. So as with any other technology, be it renewable or not, um, they will probably be suitable for certain types of markets, depending on the size or the scale by which you utilize them. So grids, standard grids, which um, the way that other people or parts of the world understand grid as macro grids, um, for islands, we probably are talking about mini grids more often than not. And there are industries that probably have higher value than just standard values um, that could take advantage of uh, different technologies. But there are also other sectors that could be beyond just the standard value. So transportation was mentioned earlier, food, water, right? Maybe even um, economic uh, support industries for whether it's oil and gas or other marine maritime sectors and even green tourism. And now they call it blue green tourism because they're combining land and sea. But there are also ultra high values, which may not be the scope for this panel, but these are things that look into, you know, health and sort of security. So, and you see here on the y-axis on the right side, different sizes by which you enable um, certain technologies to enter these different markets. And, and the importance of knowing that in, in island ecosystems, we probably operate on the mini grid and sort of the elevated high value for supporting industries like transport and aquaculture and uh, water, you know. Um, sometimes more than we talk about it, but actually for island people, and I myself coming from the Philippines, we are an archipelagic country. We understand the need for integrated solutions. Um, if you talk about just energy and just power plants without knowing sort of the productive use of that, I think you're missing out on synergistic economic, socioeconomic benefits. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So markets don't just need the energy, we actually need energy systems. And I think our colleagues here mentioned about thinking about not, not just uh, the renewable energy technologies coming in, but also the upgrades needed, um, grid, battery energy storage systems, you know, all those things that enable um, the adoption of, let's say, sustainable energy ecosystems requires you to change the thinking around how we look at um, uh, energy uh, technology adoption and usage. So there are support infrastructure and mechanisms that may be very strategic to speak about in the first instance, rather than sort of an ad hoc, um, as we go bootstrap kind of thing. I think we need to bring it all up front and agree on a strategy uh, with our eyes wide open. So um, all of these things, you know, technical, uh, so the engineers, yes, sure, they will find this very interesting, but I, I, I kind of think that uh, we, need, we need everyone on the table and this special framework of political, economic, social, technological, legal, and environmental probably captures um, most, if not all of the stakeholders that need to be involved. So next slide, please. <clears throat> so some examples um, I'm gonna go through and these examples have certain learnings. Uh, one of which is um, a group of islands in the north of Scotland called the Orkney Islands. They had this program, well, it's a project they say, but it's actually a, a program called um, Responsive Flexibility, or they call it the Reflex Project. So they want to look at um, 
integrated energy systems. And by that, they mean, okay, uh, let's look at power generation, sure, from renewables, sure, that's good, but also how we can um, do improve uh, uh, usage or maybe even not just energy efficiency, but can we be more productive and be intentional about the use of uh, the clean energy? So they looked at uh, renewables, transport, heating, electricity uh, in the first instance, but then you know they also looked at other uh, potential um, businesses around it and even business models around it. Um, why do I highlight this? Next slide, please. In the Orkney Islands, they uh, have done some really wonderful things and they are the host of the European Marine Energy Center, a topic which I love very much, um, looking at ocean renewables, which I think is very, very applicable to uh, island nations. Um, solar on land, uh, you easily use up the space, even if you have rooftop solar. So you tend to look at spaces beyond the island and then sort of the sea is probably the next um, frontier. And so floating PV projects, um, I know Cindy's uh, in the room, but the, I mean, in the Pacific Islands, they're looking at floating PV in marine and offshore locations, that's good. But there's, there's more marine renewable energy resources actually in marine and offshore spaces. You have potential for offshore wind, you have potential for marine biomass, you have potential for currents and waves and thermal gradients. So, so all of these are, are options for, for countries which have marine space. The Orkney Islands um, have uh, been at 107% renewable energy um, already in 2014. So it's not impossible to be 100% renewables actually for islands. And they are planning to export um, already back to sort of mainland Scotland. And beyond that, they looked at um, innovation um, initiatives such as the uh, hydrogen economy. So can they use hydrogen for land transport, for sea, and also for airplanes? So it won't be long before we see, of course, electric vessels, you know, proliferating in, in islands. And I think the Maldives has, um, as part of their roadmap already to look at electrification of not just land-based transport, but also sea transport. It might be something to look at in the Pacific islands as well, you know? And if you do that in the first instance, and you say, if we have electric boats and electric uh, vehicles on land, so the utilities coming onto the table, what does that mean for them? Oh, we're gonna need charging stations and we're gonna need to up our uh, resiliency for the grid. And therefore, you know, it, it opens up a, a different uh, level of conversation. The Orkney Islands are also the center, it is one of the centers of excellence uh, for the blue economy. And you can see with all the icons there, what that means, you know? So it's probably something which I encourage all islands to sort of think about. What is the blue economy for our island nations? What does that mean for us? Is there something that's already happening in terms of marine operations or marine businesses that could be more sustainable or could be scaled up better because of the presence of, let's say, sustainable energy or, or, or better sort of management of energy? Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, Singapore is another location. Um, so I'm, I'm based in Singapore and these are some good examples of what uh, we can learn from. They have a renewable energy integration demonstrator Singapore reads for short where they quote unquote play around with uh, different uh, configurations of microgrids. They thought about this way back in 2014, 2015, um, but they, only sort of launched it or opened it up, I, I think um, five, six years ago. But so what that uh, gave them was the understanding of how different energy technologies could be integrated and could cooperate um, seamlessly, um, given that different islands will have probably different requirements. So they put in different technologies in there and what they did was a consortium of all in different industry players to come in and, and look at next generation technologies being test bedded in, in an island like that. And what I mean is like um, power electronics, you know, AC, DC, uh, power electronics, next generation systems like that. 
even now looking at, and I think some of our colleagues from the Pacific Islands visited Singapore, um, met with the Energy Research Institute there and um, were amazed to see um, solid state transformers. And for engineers, that's a wow technology because that means I could have a, a space which is much, 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 much less than a traditional transformer, uh, maybe 30% only. And I could utilize both AC and DC now using power electronics on that transformer. So it's better controllability and it's modular too. So I don't need to stick to sort of standard sizes of transformers anymore. I could actually um, use different modules and do the step up, step down by software. So that, that's, a, that's a big thing. Um, beyond just this renewable energy, uh, of course the productive use has been a big thing, but you have certain examples like a floating fish farm, for instance, this is a closed circulation fish farm, um, which could be utilized for um, food, uh, sustainable food production uh, initiatives, desalination systems. So how um, Singapore tried to look at combining tourism with sort of the design of the desalination plant, that doesn't look like a desalination plant at all. It looks like a park, right, on the upper right. But, but if you think about it, uh, why do it that way? It's because a desalination plant coupled with uh, some form of touristic activities would probably have synergistic benefits. And for land scarce countries like Singapore, Pacific Islands, et cetera, space is of a premium. They need to maximize space. And this is one way of doing it. Electrification of boats, so that's happening. They have government agencies working with private sector to enable pilot projects like this uh, electric ferry between Shell um, and uh, an island refinery and the mainland. They're looking at artificial reefs and you could you know, um, accelerate um, coral reef uh, growth using um, electricity as well. Um, obviously there's marine floating PV and you know, that's not the first sort of electric boat that happened in Singapore. They also have it in, in rivers as part of their river boat crews. So if we can just imagine one step further, stitching a lot of these initiatives and maybe talking about it at a strategic level, that might be a better way to spend resources. Next slide, please. Um, the example of the Maldives. Um, so we're doing some work now to look at uh, other renewable energy beyond solar. Um, for instance, in this island, uh, looking at, we're looking at wind and wind working with solar um, obviously uh, increases resiliency because you have optionality, but also uh, kind of is a test bed for how might we integrate other renewables into um, renewable energy inclusive islands uh, or solar inclusive islands already. Um, I, I like the fact that the Maldives phased out, uh, you know, they have very nice names, poised and now it's assured. So are we poised for renewables? And now it's like assuring that we are actually uh, integrating more renewables. So, and, and they did that sort of intentionally, you know, not to perfect it in the first instance, but to phase it, phase one, all the way to three for one project. And I think they also paced the, the amount of islands and the scale by which they, they integrated renewable energy. So I think there's some learning here that, that we can get um, in terms of, of basically doing progressive development. And I think that approach is, is perfect for, for a lot of islands. Um, and our colleague here, Sean, uh, mentioned about um, looking at other renewables. So we're now looking at currents and waves and, and maybe ocean thermal um, to be part of, uh, let's say, the electricity mix. Next slide, please. Um, so the Philippines uh, obviously has some initiatives as well. Uh, this is a integration of productive uses of renewable energy and particularly one that was funded out of an EU access to sustainable energy um, program. Uh, they have a project in the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region of Muslim Mindanao, BARM for short, and there's an island there called the Tawi Tawi of group of islands. And um, the first instance was to just deploy uh, solar and battery uh, to displace diesel. But then obviously uh, the productive use of the energy should make sense locally. And they can't invent stuff and say, oh, why don't we start a sardine factory or why don't we start you know, some weaving, uh, et cetera. No, they had to look around and say, what do these people do? And their source of income was from seaweed, uh, seaweed production, harvesting and all that. 
So if you then integrate, you know, the, the narrative of productive uses of the renewable energy, then actually you may not be looking at an, an economic model that has ROIs just based on uh, power purchase agreements, not anymore on just a tariff, but actually you're looking at higher value products, which if you integrate with energy systems will probably make a faster ROI rather than just the electricity per se. So beyond this, uh, I think Unido also intends to um, fund maybe the water um, uh, segment of this. So you look at food, energy, water, so that's a nexus right there. Then seaweed is the productive use. So I think we can learn a lot from this. And I, I strongly believe that if we were looking at blue economy development, the combination of, of energy, food, and water already entails sort of a lot of livelihood uh, benefits. So impact investors, uh, beware, <laughs> watch out or stand um, ready. So next slide, please. <clears throat> the, the introduction of different uh, renewable energy technologies, whether they be marine renewable energy or not, but for me, I, I focus on the marine renewable energy side, um, requires that progressive development. And I think if you have one-off projects happening in smaller scale in certain islands, that's okay. And when you learn from those things, off-grid islands and microgrids, your pilots, and you scale that up slowly in terms of phases, then you can get to the larger markets, which is where you have large grid connected or, or clustered set of islands that are interconnected may or not be uh, the case for uh, islands that we're talking about, but definitely a pathway towards uh, the use of technologies in appropriate uh, manners in these markets. So the suitability plays a lot here. Next slide, please. Um, the potential pilot projects can start off with you know, floating platforms where you have maybe the electrical use or the load like cold storage or ice making and water production on the platform itself. It doesn't need to be brought back to shore, but then because it's movable, then you know, there is a certain element there of ease of, of uh, installation, ease of maintenance. And then you can look at uh, then scaling that up and, and learning, learning by doing the test beds, integrating different innovations, technologies, and business models. You know? And that could span anything from transportation to ice making, to aquaculture, to ports, to water, and even reef restoration and monitoring. Let my last slide, um, next slide, please. It's just this pathway. Um, so even though on the lower left, we start off with different efforts whether it's pilots, looking at various agencies, developmental orgs, um, smaller industries, that's sort of the seed of it. And, and, and it's okay that we start off with those one-off type projects. Maybe that's what we have now. But perhaps we need to paint this three-stage figure where we know that we are going to reach that enriched regional ecosystem. And this is where sort of us connecting the dots will be a, a, a big sort of change in mindset. This middle stage where we need a hub, this is where we do proper coordination. And that is really good for inward investment, to attract inward investment. And I would say that uh, this is just one um, framework that, could, that we could use for looking at blue economy. But I would like to maybe, one, one key message is that if we intend to speak about true sustainability, then we can't just speak about energy for energy's sake. Um, actually, we need to look at the wider aspect of it. In, and one of the priority areas should be that um, economic development agencies of those countries probably need to start really talking to the, the power and energy um, stakeholders together now and, and probably define that. So what are we um, doing energy security for? You know, It can't just be because I want everyone to have uh, lights at home. There needs to be some economic development angle, a social economic benefit back, and maybe that is the bigger picture. So I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Um, so we've had an interesting uh, hour and a half so far with uh, Katrina and Abe uh, presenting the Pacific context. Uh, we had Mike uh, talking about the uh, the kind of choices Hawaii made. Uh, in terms of how they'd want to scale up solar as well as other renewable energy. We've had uh, Abdullah talking about some of the choices that the Maldivian government made in terms of how they would want to provide services 
to nearly 192 islands in terms of trying to set the utility structure to be more functional, uh, supporting some of the early stage investments in terms of the grid, diesel gensets, and then also in terms of uh, planning ahead in terms of a roadmap as well as other support. Mike has helped paint for us, uh, you know, what's beyond energy, energy plus, and particularly in an area that's of keen interest uh, in, in, in the Pacific in terms of what could happen with the blue economy. We had uh, one presentation on business models for utilities in the emerging uh, scenario. Now that's something the speaker was unable to make it due to a family emergency. Uh, however, the presentation and the recording will be made available uh, through the website. And so that touches upon a few elements around uh, how are utilities responding today, you know, as they work with prosumers, uh, what's their, uh, you know, initial reaction and how does that play out? So there's, there's some interesting elements there as well as how do utilities need to evolve um, as they kind of take on a platform role. So that'll be available on the website. We now move uh, to Mark Fogarty. Mark Fogarty represents the private sector. He's had a very distinguished career um, and is con currently involved with PFAN. Um, Mark, could you, for us, could you help kind of paint out some of the challenges that the private sector sees where they're trying to invest in, in the Pacific SIDS? And what is it that you know, agencies uh, like ADB, uh, you know, through our public sector or private sector could do mm. to bring this needed capital in? Because clearly all of it is not going to happen through the public sector. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Len, and good morning. Um, I've got some good news to the delegates. Um, I've only got five minutes. I'm filling in for Navit, who uh, I think is going to run after this uh, with a presentation. So I'm not going to flog you to death with a PowerPoint presentation. Um, I just, in keeping with Len's introduction, I think just cover off on, you know, I think summarise some of the issues for the private sector. And I think in doing so, just reflect on what I think has been an excellent range of presentations that we've had here this morning from the fellow panelists. Um, I, I wanted to uh, also then, I think, and, and this is Len, uh, I look around the room, there's many people, um, some I recognize, but many people I think who've traveled long distances. So I think it's important for us to give the opportunity for, uh, to hear some questions and I think try and provide some answers and allow, um, I guess, the delegates to put on the table some ideas and things on the back of what they've heard this morning. Um, we've got a very important uh, presentation. I, I noticed Chris down there who's chairing, moderating the next section on regulatory issues. Look, so from the private sector, there's not really any great bells and whistles and things that we need to be aware of. Are you running the clock? Just to give me an idea? No, you're not. Doesn't matter. Um, I, I'm only going to do five minutes. I'm not going to go through the slides. So look, I think that um, it, it's still the same. It's risk and reward. And I think many of the presentations we've heard here this morning, I think touch on some very important elements of that. If you had been coming to these or the, the fortune to come to a number of these ASEFs over years as I've done, you would start with the technology issues uh, Michael sort of touched on that, the importance of the infrastructure. So half a dozen years ago, we were all about solar and what was, what was going to be the technologies, what was going to be the infrastructure, what was going to be the hardware that was going to drive this along. And then I think ADB, to its credit, um, evolved um, the ASEF a lot more into the financing. And, 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 and I guess where we're up to now is the speed of the transition and, and particularly for this year, um, what are the impacts, obviously, for the pandemic? And and Katarina talked very eloquently about those in her video presentation this morning. We know what the the, the impacts are. We've had a big slowing down in demand, and and of course, that impacts upon um, the bankability. And I think the uh, the importance of just where our utilities fit into the into the into these important energy economies. And I and I acknowledge Gordon down here from the PPA who do a great job, I think, coordinating many of these utilities right the way across the Pacific and particularly looking at the important issue for uh, for the private sector, just where the bankability sits, how do we get a bankable proposition um, going forward? From a regulatory sense, I think um, we've made a lot of great um, steps forward. We've got 
uh, renewable energy law, we've got sustainable energy law, we've got energy law uh, embedded in many of the economies uh, through Palau and Tonga, uh, Samoa, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we've made good steps forward and, and I think Chris will probably navigate uh, in the next section into that, uh, just the development. But I, I look at the issue from the private sector and, and uh, Katarina touched on it, the tariff issue, uh, we've introduced much stronger regulatory sort of processes. We've got opera, I think, probably in the room here or talking on the next session about just how we get a much more robust tariff setting proposition going. So I, I look at it over my time. I think we've made a lot of progress in the Pacific. I think that many of the people in this room contributed to that. And I think that it's, it's, it's bankable. But I go back to the first presentation this morning, which was Abraham. I think he touched on... Uh, the most important element that's still missing a bit, and, and I guess a reflection on not only just um, the Pacific Islands, but also the big one uh, um, I look at from Australia's perspective, just the whole planning regime. More often than not, these plans tend to be political propositions that are put forward, and where do they actually connect um, with what Michael left us with in the last presentation, the importance of people, the importance of how do we incorporate the social economic outcomes that we're looking for. How do we make use of productive use? And, and there's some great examples in his presentation there that I think highlight the economics um, and the opportunities associated with this. And, and I leave that with many of the island countries on just how do we use agricultural opportunity, agricultural waste product, or whether it be aquaculture in the presentation from um, from Ocean Pixel. Um, so I think there are many more opportunities that we think outside just the infrastructure, but we think about how investable the systems are that we may want to put in. And it's not just about the kilowatts, it's not just about the solar systems that we're implementing, but it's about the systems, the ecosystems that we're putting in and how they impact upon, um, how they impact upon the energy economies that we're, we're seeking. So yes, reward will always be the most important thing for the private sector, um, but how do we go about ma maximizing that? And to some extent that falls down to LEN uh, and the ADB and the donor organizations and the, and the commercial banking propositions. Uh, and I thought that the Maldives highlighted that with just where they're going with their, their Assure program. I thought that was a great demonstration of what's needed. We need to blend up the financing. It's not just going to be debt. It's not just going to be equity, but it's going to be a combination of much more innovative opportunities, first loss guarantees, um, and, and, and you know the blended concepts that, that make up um, what we need to put in place for the Pacific. I think that's where we need to go. Big chunky money on infrastructure is important. Big chunky money on finishing Tina Hydro or looking at the electrification propositions that needs to come in from the donor. But it's then how do we get down and how do we blend um, the products? Then I, I think um, I'm just looking, it says five minutes are up. So I'm going to leave um, you um, just with those thoughts. And, and again, I, I commend you to think long and hard about, I think many of the, the issues that that were touched on by the panelists here this morning. Thank you, Len. Thank you so much, uh, Mark. I think that's been helpful to bring out some of the private sector perspective. Um, I realize we are already beyond time. So what we'll do is um, I will use my discretion as the moderator to ask one question. Uh, and this is, I, I noticed we have uh, Siddharth Shah from, from the Office of Public-Private Partnerships here. And ADB, of course, is uh, transitioning into the new operating model. Um, so just taking on from what Mark was talking of in terms of the private sector, uh, OPPP at, at ADB has been helping with some of these transactions in the Pacific. Um, how do you see, Sid, how do you see ADB, um, OPPP, and, and the public sector working together to be able to kind of get to these end goals that are really hairy and ambitious? Uh, because clearly it can't just be done by the public sector. Is that working? Yeah. 
So Lynn, first of all, thanks for putting me on the spot here. Um, so um, look, um, I want to, I mean, this whole session was excellent and the speakers made great points. Um, I want to pick it up from where I think Abe left it, you know, his, his, his closing remark was like, you know, just let's get on with it, yeah. Um, so I think, um, um, I think that's a very important aspect. And I think um, um, that's where um, particularly ADB and our office can help, you know, we work as transaction advisor, um, where we kind of put all the elements which are there together um, and bring these projects to the market for private sector to invest. And, and, there, and there's a whole lot of stuff which goes into that. Uh, but it can be done. Um, we have just closing a very successful project in Palau, uh, a solar and battery project, and the COD of it is this next month. Uh, we are currently in midst of a project in, which is in bidding for, um, for Timor Leste. You know, Dr. Paolo, um, who's the head of the utility, is here. And in the Maldives project also, as you know, which uh, was spoken about, uh, ADB, our office is acting as advisor. So I don't have time to go through all of the stuff. Maybe I can just, um, you know, just quickly summarize, you know, four or five things we need to think about. I think the first is just getting the project preparation right. What I mean by that is getting the land issue sorted out. Um, many times uh, land is very, very difficult in Pacific Islands. Um, this is not something which the private sector can sort out. It is something which the government has to sort it out. So I think the first issue is the land. Um, the second issue is around the transmission interconnection. I think uh, a lot of the grids are not uh, well prepared to take all the variable renewable energy. So yes, they are very uh, ambitious and very good targets set up for renewable energy, but I think a lot of work needs to be done on the grid side which people forget about it. That's kind of the unsexy part, but an essential part. So I think that's the other thing which the utilities needs to plan is this interconnection. Um, then the next part comes is around just the documentation in terms of the PPA, the contractual structure, the risk allocation. Now, the good news is that, you know, we already have a lot of good working models, so we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, but I think there needs to be an understanding of what it means um, and uh, what it means to the people, what it means to the utility, what it means to the regulator. So I think that needs to be well thought through. Uh, but the good news is that there are good models that are out there. Um, then the next issue we face around is around the credit, yeah, from a private sector perspective. Yes, yeah? so, um, how do we deal with the credit because the utilities, I mean, that's, it's variable across the region, but sometimes utilities don't have good credit. Then, you know, how do we credit enhance it so that the private sector gets comfortable? So that can be done either through a, a guarantee from Ministry of Finance or from third party credit enhancements, you know, where uh, ADB and other multi actors provide political risk guarantee or some kind of uh, liquidity uh, guarantee. So there are different programs uh, which are available out there. Um, then, then the next thing is actually the market itself. You need to do marketing of this project if you want to get good players in uh, because people may not be normally looking at Pacific, uh, a lot of the good players. Um, and I think it's important that you go out there and, and make people aware of this project. Uh, one also needs to understand you're not going to get people who want to do gigawatt projects in, Mald in, you know, in Pacific Islands. It's going to be smaller subset of play I mean, smaller players, but they're also very good. But we need to kind of go out there and market it, you know, uh, because people may not be aware of these opportunities. So I think that's the, the next thing. And of course, you know, you run an open and transparent uh, process where everybody feels comfortable that the rules of the games are being followed and it's all, all very visible. The last thing I will say is that, um, which is kind of my pet thing, is that you know, the job is not done once the asset is created. Yeah, I think we need to kind of uh, move away from a traditional, um, you know, that um, you know, it has to be output-based rather than input-based. So the way the contractual structure needs to work out, uh, especially when we are talking about IPP uh, and other private sector participation, 
is that private sector should be incentivized and paid when they actually produce the power, not when they create the asset. Now, there are different ways of doing it, but the essential element is that the, the returns should not be upfront, it should be spread over time uh, as the asset uh, produces. So, so I think um, risk is an interesting thing, but you have to look at from a holistic uh, perspective. But uh, the good news is that this can be done uh, and they're very successful models. Um, and, um, and I see a lot of potential and hope uh, I think a lot of countries are seriously thinking about this, and and I think uh, we are on the we are on the right path here. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sid. I think that's that's really helpful to put into context in terms of what needs to be done and how ADB is also stepping up to to meet some of these challenges in the region. Um, I open it up to the audience. Uh, are there any questions that you think would be uh, answered by the panel. Uh, please consider this as the start of a discussion. Um, there are gonna be certain elements that you know, will take time to sit down and explain. And we'll probably also be setting up a couple of uh, follow-on meetings and discussions if there's interest. So please please do reach out uh, to the organizers and we'll be trying and doing that given the kind of uh, panel members we have and the depth of the issues that need to be covered. So we'll be happy to do that, but if there's any burning questions, um, happy to take them on now. Thank you. I'm Dina from ADB Institute in Tokyo. Uh, my question, first slide, sh first presentation showed us that Pacific Islands aiming very ambitious renewable energy in grids and even like Solomon Islands, 100%. This is very good, but um, the intermittency problem will will have. So what are your suggestions for dealing with intermittency, a part of like grid scale battery, because that's still expensive. So what solutions would you recommend? Thank you. Thanks. I think uh, we can probably go to uh, Mark and, and maybe uh, Abdullah Nashid in terms of some of the changes in batteries that you're looking at. Okay. Yeah, and I saw another related question, I think, on the on the, the app of, you know, how do we get to such high levels of variable renewable energy on our grids and without storage? And how much can you do without storage? So kind of in our experience for our island systems, um, we can get to about 20% by energy renewable with wind and solar without much battery uh, storage, but um, you need other kind of foundational elements to be in place. Like they mentioned, the, uh, the first you look at your generation resources, right? So the renewables are gonna need a dance partner. Uh, so we looked at our um, fossil fuel fleet. Um, we have very old <laughs> uh, steam turbines. So kind of told the, the septen, septenarian uh, 70 year old um, power plants, you're not gonna waltz anywhere, you're gonna have to do salsa, right? So we added uh, increased ramp rates, uh, did some uh, variable speed drives, different technologies to get them more flexible. We had to turn them down, have a lower minimum operating point to make more room for renewables. You need the automatic generation control system because humans can't dance real quick with all these renewables and all these resources balancing. Um, uh, so flexibility is is a big thing. The other big thing is grid codes. You need the resources to support the grid, not just use the grid, right? Uh, they need to have, uh, you know, voltage regulation, frequency response. And then the good thing is all the modern inverters, wind turbines, they all can, they can do these things without, you know, much added cost. They, they just come, come with it. Uh, so there's a lot of, a lot of foundational things to put in place, but you can get pretty far without so storage then depending on your grid, of course, it's all grid specific, but um, I think on Kauai, they started out with uh, storage that was for frequency rig, once they started to get to higher penetration levels. Um, and then once you get to beyond the 20%, you kind of start to between 20, 30% having to do the energy shifting. Then you get to 70% level where they're at the kind of at the 60% level. You, you can't do the four hour shifting anymore. You need the long-term storage to kind of get beyond that point um but it's yeah and it all comes through like you said to get things moving get the get do you have to do the study work you need to do the the variability assessment make sure your grid can handle it um and then get the resources that you know you can handle and you can can move forward i think a lot of times if you don't do that study work and you're trying to connect things the the fear of the unknown and uncertainty kind of 
kind of makes people stop and hesitate. Thanks. And yeah, uh, I, f I fully agree with uh, what Mark has uh, mentioned, but I would like to emphasize on the importance of intelligent energy uh, management systems together with the battery energy storage and the renewable energy for larger penetrations of uh, renewable energy into the grid. And uh, together with this, yes, uh, our grids are very old in uh, most of the islands, so grid rehabilitation is a must. And uh, with intelligent energy monitoring and energy management systems, actually in Maldives, we have attained um, um, uh, turning off the generator from uh, for eight to 10 hours with a high level penetration of renewable energy in smaller islands. So it can be done, but it should be with the latest um, energy monitoring and intelligent uh, energy management systems uh, coupled with uh, communications and uh, uh, who, which can respond to the frequency uh, changes and the voltage frequency responses. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, having diversity of options is always a good choice. And uh, just wanted to check if anyone else on the panel wanted to add to that else. I think we are already almost out of time. Just a comment on that, what uh, Mark uh, said, you know, you really need a good plan put in place. And at each level, there's different complexities and complications that have come in with VRE. And uh, you need to plan for that ahead. And because in the Pacific Islands, they have very aggressive targets. They're all aiming for 100% or near 100%, most of them. So we are going to face a lot of these issues with controllability, with... Uh, with uh, stability and uh, you know riding through events without crashing the whole system these are things that the operators will struggle with and you need to take all that into consideration and make sure it's uh, it's all implemented um, but these are difficult things for the public to understand mm -hmm. And I've always said, you know, when you're managing a company, you're not only managing the operations, you're managing the perception of it. And often that's where we fail in the grid. And so the public has a different perception and they think and expect certain things because they're not being managed well. And that's another challenge. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, I think we can continue the conversation over coffee because I do know that we have another session, which is also going to be very interesting on, on regulation, right? It's starting at 11. So thank you all. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Thank you for your patience and uh, thank you.